This is Shanta, a school student with an artistic bent of mind. She also loves connecting art with mathematics. Today she's going to try her hand at making the fascinating Mobius strip. Let's see how it works. Shanta starts off with a loop of paper. Now instead of just gluing the ends together, she's going to twist the loop once before gluing. So we get a strip like this, which we call a Mobius strip. Still haven't understood the excitement? Then take a pen and draw a line along the center. You will find that you have drawn a line on both sides of the loop. But without lifting your pen or crossing any edge. The paper has only one side. Now take a highlighter and color the edge of the strip. You'll find both edges are colored. There's only one edge. What we have here is a one-sided surface. The famous Dutch artist MC Escher, who Shanta loves, immortalized this idea by visualizing an ant crawling over the strip. Now this ant would be able to walk over both sides of the strip before returning to the start. Welcome to the Maths Factor. In this episode, we're exploring a host of magical shapes like the Mobius strip. We'll meet up with potters, ironsmiths, paper folders and knot tires throughout the journey through the discipline known as topology. Keep watching, it's going to be quite a ride. Back to Shanta and our Mobius strip and some more fun stuff we can do with it. If we cut through the line we drew in the center what will happen? On a normal strip, we would get two rings. But in the Mobius strip, you will end up with a large single loop. Quite cool, eh? Next, Shanta cuts along a line which divides the strip into one third instead of half. What do you think will happen? This time, two connected loops form. There's one half twist in the smaller loop and two half twists in the larger loop. Shanta is pleased with this. Shanta is going to try one more variation. She creates a new Mobius strip, but instead of one twist, she will twist it two times, like this. Now what happens when we cut through the middle of this loop? Ta-da! It's two rings that are linked together. What fun! Now Shanta could clearly keep continuing along the same lines. But I think we'll take a break from this and figure out who Mobius was. Augustus Ferdinand Mobius was a German mathematician and astronomer. He discovered the Mobius strip in 1858. Curiously enough, the same strip was discovered earlier in the same year by another German mathematician, Johann Benedict Listing, who unfortunately didn't publish in time. If he had, we may just have called it the Listing strip instead of the Mobius strip. In 1882, a mathematician called Felix Klein took the idea of the Mobius strip one step further. To do that, let's look at a bangle first. If we expand it like this, it forms a sphere. Klein, however, took two Mobius strips. He then sewed them together like this to create a bottle with a single surface and no boundaries. This shape came to be known as a Klein bottle. 
Now, what makes this both baffling and fascinating is the fact that it cannot exist in three dimensions. Because what is happening here is that the cylinder is actually passing through itself, but without a hole, which cannot happen in reality. But strangely enough, it is mathematically legal. Let's bring in an ant to help understand this. If it walks along the sphere, it can circumnavigate it. But go inside it, it'll need to make a hole. On the other hand, an enterprising ant could walk all over the Klein bottle, up, over, in, through, round, inside, round, out, round and up to where it began without crossing any edge. Now all these odd shapes are part of an area of mathematics called topology. Topology is a modern version of geometry which studies different shapes and sizes. Let's try and see what makes topology different from geometry. Take any two shapes, say uh, two triangles. We cannot stretch them or bend them, but we can move them and flip them over. When placed on top of each other, they look identical or in geometrical terms, congruent. Shapes like this fall within the space of classical or Euclidean geometry. Next, we're going to study perspective. First, take a look at this plate. From directly above, it looks round like a circle. But walk away a few feet and look at it, and it looks much wider than long, like an ellipse, because of the angle you're at, which is the way it has been drawn. This is called perspective. While drawing, two things are considered the same if they're both views of the same object. Now we move to the home of Ravikant, the potter, to see how topology works. Topology basically investigates those properties of shapes which do not change under continuous bending and stretching. Ravikant first takes clay off the wheel and builds a sphere. He then molds this to form a cube. He then moulds the cube again to make a figure doll. In topology, all these three shapes are the same, since you can obtain one from the other without cutting or punching a hole. Now, holes are very important in topology. So if we use our clay to form a vara-like shape, let's see what it can transform to topologically. Our vara has one hole, so all our shapes need to have one hole. So an enterprising potter can mould the vara to form a needle-like shape and then eventually a coffee cup. Here the hole is the handle. In fact, the idea of a vara or a donut and coffee cup being the same is a classic idea in topology. Now all these figures are the same topologically speaking. However, a figure of eight is not because it is two holes, not one. We've done a whole lot. Let's take a break now, but we'll be back to explore Borromean rings and papers with three sides. Don't forget to join us after the break on our topological adventures on Maths Factor. Among the inseparable identity of Delhi, 
Qutub Minar has stood by the test of times and elements. Struck by lightning a few times, the 240 meter star suffered damages on its top story. Feroz Shah Tughlaq and Sekandar Lodi had commissioned the repair under the rule, but the damage most remembered was the one in the 19th century, when an earthquake had damaged the topmost story in 1803. The responsibility of the repair was given to a British officer, Major Robert Smith, who had placed a pillared cupola on the top of the minaret. After massive criticism, the then Governor General Harding ordered the cupola to be removed. It was reinstalled at the ground level to the east of Qutub Minar. It still remains there, known as Smith's Folly. पिछली चार तिमाहियों में विकास की दर में लगातार हुई है गिरावट बेरोजगारी भी है चरम पर कैसे निपटा जाए इस समस्या से जानने के लिए देखिए मेरे साथ अर्थ नीति शनिवार शाम साढ़े सात बजे सिर्फ राज्यसभा टेलीविजन पर On our journey through the magic of topology, we've explored a bunch of interesting shapes. Our next shape takes us to northern Italy, to the Lake Maggiore. Now, in the middle of the lake are three islands: Isola Bella, Isola Madre, and Isola Superiore. These islands belong to the Borromeo family. They own a lovely Baroque palazzo. But what interests us here is their family logo. which is three interlinked circles now the curious fact here is that all look interlinked but if we cover the red circle the other two look they are on the top of the other not linked in any way we can do the same thing again by covering the green and blue circles also now the idea is that if you cut one ring you will free the other two Let's try our hand and constructing Borromean rings to see if that really works. To do that, we need to meet up with Om Prakash, who is an iron smith. What he does is take two pieces of iron. He then molds them to form rings. He places one on top of another. Then he creates a third ring that he weaves through the other two. under the first over the second and back under like this he welds this one together and we have boromian rings now what happens if he cuts one ring all three fall apart Now Borromean rings seem to have a mystical resonance. If we travel to the Varundeswarar temple in Chennai, we can see Borromean figures carved in its pillars that date back to the 6th century. In Christian art, Borromean rings are often used to represent the Holy Trinity. The same arrangement can be made with interlocked triangles. These were a symbol of the warring Vikings and is known as the walk knot. Now the walk knot symbol is often found in places where there are fallen viking heroes. It has also been found carved into a bed post used in a ship burial. Now let's head back to Shanta's workroom. She is still engrossed with paper and is trying to replicate another fascinating shape. Let's look at this paper. It is two sides. If we look at 3D objects, a pyramid has four sides, a cube has six. Now it's pretty rare to see a 3D object with three sides. Shanta is trying to make one. It's called a hexaflexagon. She starts off with long strips of paper like this. And then she starts folding them in a zigzag way to make shapes. 
Now let's slow Shanta down a bit and see what she's doing with this paper. She folds them to form a series of equilateral triangles. Then she does a series of flip overs. She glues it together to make our hexaflexagon. Now she draws smiley faces on one side and sad faces on the other. She then folds the hexagon along the lines to loosen it up. She flips it over and we have another side. No smiley or sad faces. Where did that come from? Shanta has made an object with three sides. Now Shanta is going to make an even more interesting hexaflexagon which will have six sides. Let's see if that's true. We color one side red and then keep flexing. And as three new sides appear, we keep coloring them. Blue first. Then green. Yellow. Pink. And purple. Wow! One paper with six sides. Quite magical, right? Many years ago, in 1939 to be precise, an Englishman by the name of Arthur H. Stone, who was studying at Princeton, created the shapes that Shanta just made. Let's take a quick breather now, but we'll be back with a whole lot of knots, which we'll explore with fun games and mad doodles. So keep watching The Maths Factor. Succeeding Mohammed bin Tughlaq, 45-year-old Firoshah Tughlaq took over the reins of a shrinking Delhi Sultanate. As he decided not to capture the areas lost, Firoshah built another city to house his capital. Firozabad, the new city of Delhi, was chosen to be founded in the year 1354 on the banks of River Yamna. The fort, which is today surrounded by a vast expanse of Delhi's urban growth, once stood as a symbol of an all-encompassing city. Firosha Tughlaq's kingdom is also remembered for a department of charity called Divani Kherat. Within his city, he constructed several hospitals, sarais and roads. Opened a hospital for the poor in Delhi called Darul Shifa. Great gardens were laid out in the city as per the account of Shamsi Siraj Afif. The number ran as high as 1200 gardens. Though smaller in size than the mighty Tughlaqabad, massive ramparts were also built to withstand any attack. Arisen from a multi hued cultural canvas. Tradition and cultural fervor dating back centuries. And encircling them all, there's a magic that awes. Embrace your nation's brilliant human warmth. Watch Colors of India, Sundays at 9.30 p.m. on Rajya Sabha Television. One of the greatest exponents of Carnatic music. 
MS Subalakshmi or MS to her fans. An icon even to a younger generation brought up on fusion and rock music. MS is the first musician ever to be awarded the Bharat Ratna, also the first Indian musician to receive the Raymond Magsaysay Award. As India's cultural ambassador, she also performed at the UN General Assembly in 1966. Former Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru once said of MS, Who am I, a mere Prime Minister, before a Queen, a Queen of Music? We're exploring an area of mathematics called topology in this episode. We've already explored holes, rings and strips. Now let's move to knots. Knots populate a life. From tying a shoelace to tying a bow, to untying an animal, to tying a ribbon on a present, knots are an integral part of our lives. And they've been for a very long time. Before we start off on knot theory, Dave is going to help us figure what a mathematical knot is. For this, he pulls out a rope and tape. He first ties a knot in the rope. He then tapes the two loose ends of the string together. He has now trapped the knot on the string. No matter how long you attempt to disentangle the string, you will never succeed without cutting the string open. Now this models the mathematical concept of a knot. Now Dave is going to show you how two knots are equivalent. Here's one knot. Now Dave changes the knot, which means he rearranges it without cutting the rope to look like this. According to knot theory, this and this are equivalent. Now we have a bunch of kids who are going to try another fun game to learn about knots. Let's call it Untwister. They all stand in a circle, then they join hands, but not with the person standing next to them. And both hands are not joined with the same person. They then twist and climb and duck under each other's arms, but don't let go of each other's hands, until they're standing in a circle again, completely untangled. If you have enough people, it sometimes happens that you end up in two circles. So a fun game can teach us a bit about maths. Now the mathematical theory of knots was born out of attempts to model the atom. Near the end of the 19th century, Lord Kelvin suggested that different atoms were actually different knots tied in ether that was believed to permeate all of space. Physicists and mathematicians set to work making a table of distinct knots believing they were making a table of the elements. Now this idea, fascinating though it was, was proved untrue, but it led to the development of knot theory as a mathematical discipline. Let's move to Lavleen Bhagat, who is an artist. She is going to try her hand at drawing some knots. It's rather fun. So what she does at first is draw a random squiggle. Now using the squiggle as a guideline, she makes under and over pattern. And then she completes the knot. Then she tries her hand at a more elaborate squiggle. And with a felt pen this time, it can have as many loops as possible. But the final two ends, one interesting insight, any direction that you go and any amount of branchings that you take always make a perfect over-under pattern. Now Mrs. Bhagat gets more adventurous and tries a hand at drawing Celtic knots. These are historic patterns that appear in Scotland and also in Roman mosaics and patterns by Vikings and Saxons as well. Columns, which are traditional patterns drawn outside homes in South India, are also not like 
Mrs. Bhagat tries her hand at a traditional Naga Mandala drawing. The Naga Mandala is a pattern formed by a snake which weaves itself into a number of knots called Naga Bandha. Snakes are considered auspicious and one can find these Naga Mandalas drawn on floors or carved in the wall, pillars of temples in many parts of India. I think we are all knotted out, so let's move into another zone where I want to introduce you to my favourite mathematical theorem. It's called the Hairy Ball Theorem and yes, it's a name that charms me. So what does the theorem state? Take a ball covered with hair all over. Now however we comb this ball, the hair will never lie flat. There will be at least one special point from where all the hairs radiate or a tuft where all the hairs meet and protrude. Well, it can be applied to other situations such as wind currents on planet Earth. At each point on the Earth's surface, we can measure the wind speed and direction, which is equivalent to the length and the direction of a hair. Now, the closer the points, the closer the wind velocities. Using this theorem, we can conclude that if the wind is blowing in some direction at every point on the Earth's surface, then there must be at least one point where the wind speed is zero. That is, the wind is not blowing and it has calm. This is equivalent to the hole in the hair. This point is the eye of a cyclone or anticyclone. Like the swirled hairs on the tennis ball, the wind will spiral around this zero wind point. So the theorem tells us that given at least some wind on Earth, there must at all times be a cyclone somewhere. Well, this is more theoretical than literal, so don't go chasing the cyclone just yet. We have found mathematics in some of the most unexpected corners of our lives. We have explored a bunch of fascinating shapes like the Mobius strip, the Klein bottle or the Borromean rings. We have checked out knots in paper with more than two sides. We could keep going, but let's save some stuff for another episode. Keep watching The Maths Factor for more fascinating and interactive mathematics.